Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, if you happen to be new to this channel and you've not heard of this, ShakeTube is a 15 week read along of Shakespeare plays where each week we read a different play and on the Friday of that week we discuss our thoughts on the play. Uh, for this particular week we are reading King Lear. You know, this is a play I've encountered on screen with Laurence Olivier in the title role. I also read it once but both of those encounters were well over 20 years ago and I'd actually forgotten the very ending of the play which is quite tragic in typical Shakespeare fashion with a rising body count beyond belief. Um, this is basically a play about an elderly king of Britain. He's around in his 80s and he's getting tired and doesn't really want to deal with the day-to-day -day running of a kingdom but he's also very vain. He enjoys the title of king and he wants to retain that and everything that kind of goes along with it, the respect and the loyalty and um, he likes the flattery he gets. Uh, it's a way for him to kind of know the loyalty of his subjects um, and it just feeds that that vanity within him. Now he's come to the decision that, like I said, he's going to kind of retire, kind of unheard of um, in a monarch, but he decides that he's going to divide his kingdom up into three parts, uh, a part for each of his daughters. And to do this he says, um, you know, I, wa I want you to kind of profess your love to me and those, the one that loves me the most will get the largest portion of the kingdom. And he has his eldest daughter go first, Goneril, and she professes her love. Uh, and he says, okay, you and your husband are going to get this portion of the kingdom. And then Regan, the middle daughter, does the same. She tries to one-up her sister. And uh, he says, okay, you're going to get this portion. It'll be equal to your sister Goneril. Uh, and then he says, now last but not least, um, to my joy, you know, uh, <laughs> my youngest, you know, speak and uh, you'll... You, you know, see if you'll get the uh, a more opulent portion than your sister's. Now think about this. He said at the beginning, um, you know, the one that loved me most will get the largest portion. But as each one is spoken, he has decided you're getting this portion, you're getting this portion. And he's retained that last larger par portion of the kingdom for the youngest daughter. It, she is his favorite and he's assuming that her love will be, is, you know, the greatest uh, professed to him back. But when asked to speak, she says, nothing, my lord. He's like, uh, nothing? And she says, um, nothing, my lord. And he's like, nothing will come of nothing. Speak again, you know, lest it cost you your fortune. And she says, I can't heave my heart into my mouth, you know, like her sister's. Um, so he's like, how could you be so young and so untender? She says, but I'm true. And he says, well, like, let truth be your dowry. And um, he instantly kind of disowns and uh, disinherits her. Uh, um, and divides the rest of the kingdom up into just two parts, one for each of the other daughters. Uh, there, so <laughs> what's left is Cordelia, um, who was due to be married to either the kingdom, of, or the king of France or the king of Burgundy. And the king of France steps forward and says, you know, he will take what's cast away, and um, sees the true beauty within her, and um, I think sees what perhaps Lear does not. That you know, she is truthful. She does love him. She says to her father as she tries to convince him of her love that um, good my lord uh, you have begot me, bred me, loved me, I return those duties back as are right fit um, obey you, love you, and most honor you why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all happily when I shall wed that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty sure I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all um, so she says she loves her as a, as a daughter should love a father. Um, he won't hear any of it, like I said. Uh, so Kent, a, a nobleman within, who's very loyal to Lear, tries to convince Lear that he's making a huge mistake, uh, banishing, you know, the daughter, um, and dividing the kingdom the way he is. Lear won't hear anything of it. He won't hear his deci decisions questioned. Uh, Kent won't stop. And finally, Lear banishes him as well, upon pain of death. Um, but Kent kind of hangs around the kingdom, uh, he goes in disguise, and he ends up being kind of hired as a servant to Lear, without his knowing of it, and thus able to kind of like, you know, stay near him. Lear decides that he's going to spend the rest of his, his life uh, traveling from his one daughter's house, Goneril, to Regan's home, letting them kind of take care of him, uh, and he's going to be dragging along his hundred knights with him. Well, that doesn't sit very well with the, the two sisters. Uh, they see him as a doddering old man who's probably going senile and his men are out of control and when he is uh, there with Goneril he's pretty much trying to boss everybody around like he's in charge. Um, 
still in his head kind of king, uh, but not having that command anymore. Uh, and uh, she, she won't have any of it. She pretty much kicks him to the curb. So off he goes uh, to the other daughter and she almost shuts him out saying, you can't come in here with all these guys. They're out of control. They're unruly. What do you even need them for? What do you even need one for? Um, you can come in, uh, but not all these people. Well, he won't hear any of it. And by now he's just, he's losing it. Uh, he's already thought he knew who loved him most, uh, thinking his youngest daughter had had lied, betrayed him, whatever, and now he's uh, being mishandled by his other two daughters, and he goes off in a rage, kind of like a spoiled child who's upset, and the storm is raging, Kent's following after him, uh, along with the king's fool, uh, or jester, um, and he's he's just, he's raging up against at the storm, uh, blow winds and crack your cheeks, kind of this famous line, and uh, but I think the storm is almost greater within his head. Uh, the elements aren't bothering him. Uh, later on, he says to Kent, uh, when the mind's free, the body's delicate. The tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats their filial ingratitude. That's all he can think of is, you know, how these children of his are so ungrateful and don't love him. Uh, he's wandering off, um, you know, on the plains <laughs> between uh, these two kingdoms, kind of, of his, of his daughters. There's a parallel story uh, also within here of another sort of dysfunctional family. We have uh, another nobleman who's also loyal to Lear. That's Gloucester. Uh, his title sort of Earl. Um, he has an eldest son named Edgar and a bastard son named Edmund. Now, Edmund hates the term bastard. He hates illegitimate and all this stuff. And, and the fact that Edgar is going to receive his, their father's fortunes and titles and everything. So he kind of plots against the two of them. Uh, he makes Gloucester, the father, believe that Edgar is plotting against him to kill him off, thus getting um, the fortune and the title and everything right away, rather than waiting for him to die off. And then uh, he, he tricks Edgar um, also into um, going into hiding, saying, you know, our father's furious with you, he's out to kill you, and so Edgar goes off into hiding, um, thus making him look even more guilty to their father. And so once again, you have a father kind of misjudging the child that loves them the most uh, throughout the play. So you have these two kind of parallel stories going on, and they'll, the orbits will kind of intersect. Uh, Edgar ends up staying within the kingdom in disguise as well, like you have Kent um, kind of nearby. He, Edgar plays like a mad madman and... Um, uh, you see at one point uh, when he is encountering Lear, Lear who's always been kind of about himself and about his own vanity and his mind sort of starting to change. He sees this man suffering almost more than him and uh, tries to almost help him out and everything. Um, then you have also Gloucester, like I said, being very loyal uh, to Lear. Uh, he sees the only way to kind of help him is to kind of reach out to Cordelia and the King of France. and tries to make some arrangement for them to come and maybe invade if, if necessary, but something needs to be done to uh, bring this kingdom back under control because the two sisters also, uh, Goneril and Regan, do not like each other. So lots of battles and craziness going on. There's lots of dysfunctional families. Um, it's a very moving, great play to, to see visually. I'd say um, when I was reading it, the parts that I remembered seeing on screen were in my head, but uh, sometimes reading it, didn't convey that as much um, and I, I missed seeing it. I so much want to see some visual form of this play again, um, but I still thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, the way it all kind of wraps up, I don't want to get into, um, but uh, very moving parts towards the end. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was just great. It was like I said, it was, it was great kind of having that ending unknown to me once again so that I could kind of reach it fresh and everything, but it was a really intriguing look at, at kind of bad decisions, vain characters, manipulation, greed, all this is kind of going on within this play. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. King, uh, King Lear is just a, a really intriguing character. Um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this play. That was King Lear. If you guys have read this play, let me know about your thoughts down below. And uh, next up, Macbeth. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.